Today we are featuring a fantastic illustrator that I've been working with for years. Um, Mike has also jumped into 3D sculpting in the past couple few years, and he is a painter master elite. Um, so if any of you have followed Mike at all, you know that he does a lot of entertainment illustration, and his work has been featured all over the place. The list is almost too long to even say, but um, I know that he's been in the Grammy Museum, he's been in stadiums, movie promotions, TV campaigns, you know, it goes on and on. And you probably saw some of his client list, because I think, I believe I included it in the webinar information, but Marvel, which we're going to be focusing on today with Spider Gwen, Hasbro, Warner Brothers, Dimension Films, Nike, Cartoon Network, Timberland, all kinds of <laughs> clients, and Corel, as a matter of fact. Um, so I have tremendous respect for Mike, for his talent, his work ethic, and I'm super stoked about featuring him today. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to you, Mike. And let thank you take you. it away. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, too kind, Tanya. I, I've done all that because I'm a very old person. So you live long enough, you can do anything. Um, I, uh, I hope I'm sharing the right screen. First, I want to say hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us uh, for this webinar. And um, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, I'll say that first. And if you don't, uh, you can tell Tanya. And uh, I will probably never work with her again. Um, just kidding. Um, so, uh, do you see the screen with the turtle and, uh, and the princess on it? Yes. Okay, great. Then I have the right screen. All right. So, um, I think Tanya's told, told you enough about me. I don't have to say anything else. I'm going to show you, um, kind of my workflow today. Um, and it has evolved a little bit from going, uh, from just regular, uh, illustration, 2D illustration using, um, several, um, uh, reference images. Uh, from magazines and online and and uh, kind of evolved to using 3D uh, sculptures created in uh, early on in programs like Poser and uh, and Daz Studio um, to um, to uh, to now using uh, ZBrush. So very powerful tools and uh, and I think they can help 2D painters. Uh, so I'm going to uh, kind of start off the biggest question I get from people um, who are painters is, why are you using ZBrush? Why not just, um, you know, why are you going through the trouble of sculpting first and uh, and not just go ahead with the drawing and then paint it? And, uh, and that reason is because it allows me to control things like lighting and uh, find the perfect pose of the character, the right angle, and, um, and at the same time, when I'm done, I have a finished sculpt that if I later on want to go ahead and uh, do a 3D, you know, make a 3D print, uh, then I can have a piece that I can sit on my desk. So that's kind of why I do it. So these things that I have on my screen right now, I'm just going to quickly kind of show you, um, started off as sculptures uh, in ZBrush. And I did this for Upper Deck uh, cards for their Superior Spider-Man line. Um, so both of these began as... Um, it's just sculpts that I did in ZBrush. And you can see that the Spider-Man is super low res. Um, I didn't spend a whole lot of time on him. The uh, anti-venom piece was actually a uh, another uh, sculpt that I was playing around with that I, that I repurposed and posed and then kind of made him look like the character. And using both of those, I was able to use that as a base and create, uh, you know, first a sketch, and then uh, once that was approved by the client, uh, the final painting. All right. So let's let's get into let's get into the uh, kind of the the process here. All right. How we make the sausage. Um, so first thing, I'll just jump into ZBrush. And Tanya, if you have any questions from anyone, please feel free to to shoot them to me while I'm while I'm showing this. Uh, I don't know sure. how many people. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I forgot to tell everybody to please put your questions in the questions panel and we'll take care of all of them. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Yeah. So this is a, a little bit of a different uh, a different webinar that I'm doing with uh, with Tanya today than I normally do. Normally I kind of do the, the, the painting, create the painting as I'm talking to you guys. 
This one I, I did uh, earlier for, for both Corel and Wacom. Um, and, uh, and so I'm just going to kind of go over it again and show you what I did um, to create this character. But the finished painting that you guys are talking about here is this piece here, right? Um, and this all started originally as a ZBrush sculpt. So I just kind of took the uh, one of the base mesh characters of the females that I had, played with her uh, proportions a little bit, and ended up... Um, I thought everything was going to turn on here. Well, I guess not. Yeah. Um, yeah. Ended up taking her, getting her into a pose, um, and getting what I liked. And then once that was done, I started detailing her. And this is... This is kind of what happens. Um, and uh, once the character was posed and I got the, you know, the, the stitches and the wrinkles and all the things that I like to add just to make it look uh, a little more realistic, um, I did my uh, poly painting in ZBrush, which is this, right? Just basic, basic shading of the character. Uh, and took that into Keyshot, right? Set up some basic lighting for it, and then went over to Keyshot, and you can see that you get something a little more along these lines, right? Keyshot is a rendering program. If you guys don't know about it, if you're uh, if you're not familiar with the 3D side, it's very easy to use uh, with ZBrush. You just kind of there's a bridge between the two programs, and you shoot it over and determine what you want your, your lighting to look like and, uh, and your camera angle. And uh, you can see the great thing about having this as a 3D uh, sculpture, instead of just doing a drawing, is that I can rotate around it and really find, let me turn on the basic lighting here so it moves a little faster. I can, uh, I can find the angle that I want. Right, so if you're doing comic book sculptures, I'm sorry, comic book uh, drawings or or paintings, things like that, it's all about dynamic posing and uh, dynamic camera angles. So I was given a lot of different choices as to the perfect angle, and then I was able to play around with the lighting and you know turn on different lighting and uh, you know get my backlighting in there, get the the, uh, you know, the different point lights, and I was able to light this thing exactly how I wanted. You get a lot of control. So that's why I do it this way, because once that's done, I can make a render uh, of this particular piece and then take that into Corel Painter, and I end up with something along these lines. Um, which is this piece here. Right. So, um, yeah, once that's done, um, I look at it and, and I can see that there's a lot about this that I like, but there's a lot of things that I want to change. So I went in, you can see if you look at this piece and then you flip to the, uh, the one I went with, I played with her proportions to make it a little more um, dynamic and uh, a little more um, uh, perspective out, basically stretched her legs a little bit. Uh, played with the shape of her head, and uh, it feels like it's it's just a little more in motion to me. And, hey, uh, yep. Angela is wondering if you can do all the lighting in ZBrush without needing Keyshot. Yeah, you totally can. You totally can. The thing about Keyshot that I like is that it gives you a little more uh, freedom to add um, to get your shadows a little more in order, right? So the reason that I use Keyshot is that I can go in and you see that I have a, a very strong backlight on her and that's what that square is in the background. And if I turn this off, uh, not that one, sorry. If I turn this off, you can see it goes away <clears throat> and you can change your environment as well. So um, you can totally do this in ZBrush. If I come over here and I just do a BPR render, it's gonna look really good, but it will look along these lines. And if I try to add multiple lights, what happens with ZBrush is that the shadows don't, they don't really uh, react correctly if you have more than one light. But you can do it in separate passes. A lot of people do. 
Um, and you can take those passes and composite them and, and basically get the same thing that I get with, uh, with Keyshot. But it's a lot of, in a lot of instances, I'm doing this for clients and I'm in a hurry. So being able to do it as a, as a one-off, do it as one pass, and figure out the uh, the minutia later on is it saves me a lot of time. Angela says thank you. Tell Angela I said you're welcome. <laughs> yeah. So um. Yeah. So basically, if you uh, you know um, what I did after this point is I just took this character in um, in Painter, made up just a you know, just kind of a gradient background because I didn't know what my background was going to be at this at this time. Uh, and I think I only had a few days to turn this around. So just made this background. Um, I'm going to drop all those to canvas. And uh, and then I Have made a clue. Yeah. There's a question that goes back to 3D. And is, is there a reason that you prefer ZBrush to Blender? Um, I never learned Blender. I, I learned ZBrush. Um, Blender does a lot of cool things too, but I just don't know it. So, um, you know, I, and I think also if I was doing more hard surface stuff, I know that now you can sculpt in Blender. Um, you probably have been able to do it for a while, but I, I, I think when it comes to, um, you know, when it comes to doing character design and stuff for films and video games and all that, ZBrush is kind of the gold standard. Um, no, nothing against Blender, but I think that that's kind of what people in the industry use. So. And one more question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have just a guesstimate of, of how long it took you to sculpt her? Um, that's a great question. So this piece originally started as uh, just something that I wanted to play around with when I went to Comic-Con with you guys. Mm -hmm. um, so I wasn't in a real hurry. I'm not a super fast sculptor, but on this one, I only think I had um, maybe uh, a week and a half before I went to Comic-Con. So I threw it together. You can see there's not a whole lot of, you know, extra stuff on here. This book bag I got from a, a, a kit bash of something I had already. And, uh, and I just kind of made up the shoes. This, I think the entire sculpt probably took me, I mean, if I have to guess, I would have to say maybe like a week. Um, okay. you know, and that's, that's not moving. That's not moving super fast. I was doing other projects as well. The thing about these things is that I'm, I get paid to paint. Uh, at the moment, like I would love to do stuff for sculpture companies, um, or I'm sorry, uh, statue companies like, uh, you know, Sideshow and XM and all those guys. But for now, I'm still uh, an illustrator. So that's kind of what keeps the uh, keeps the food on the table. So I, I sculpt in my free time, basically. Okay, thank you. Cool. All right, so... I'm just going to pick up where I where I left off with this. So then at this point, I could do one of two things. I could either just do a paint over on this or a lot of times what I like to do is I like having the um, uh, I like having the the shades of, you know, the, the color that I want and the lighting and everything. But I don't necessarily want it to look uh, I definitely don't want it to look digital. Right. At the end of the day, this thing should feel like an illustration. Uh, and, and if you were to look at this, you wouldn't necessarily say, oh, well, he started off with a 3D, um, you know, with a 3D model as the reference. So um, I could either just, you know, do my pencils over this and then paint it. Or uh, in this case, I didn't have a whole lot of time. So what I did was a quick clone. And uh, let's see if I can get this going. All right. So here is the canvas. I'm going to uh, turn off this, and then uh, I use um, an auto paint and just select a big oil pastel as my color. Um, and then uh, just hit, hit go, basically, right? So what that's gonna do is it's gonna fill up the canvas with the these random strokes and when it's done, I'll have 
the character, it's not going to look exactly like the painting, but I'm going to have what's essentially going to be the, uh, the, the base for what I'm going to paint over top of. All right. And it's just building up here. Um, sometimes it moves faster than others it might be because I'm on the, on the call here, it's moving a little bit slower or I have like 60 things open here. So if there's any questions now, it'd be a good time to ask while we're waiting for this thing to build up. So you can see it's starting to starting to get there. And I don't want to let this cook too long, right? I don't want this to look like the source image. I just want to have the basic forms in here. So Did you hand paint the sole of the shoe? Or what is that? Um, the Because uh, I know you said with the back, it was something that you were able to kind of <laughs> yeah, drag yeah, and no. drop out. Yeah, so what happened, I'll, I'll, I'll show you this. So this is going to, if this builds up a little bit longer, you'll see what I started with. But even though this is all sculpted out and pretty much figured out here, I went and painted over uh, something a bit tighter than this to get the final image. So I, I, I did it twice, <laughs> which is something that I, I do. I didn't have to, but I wanted it to look painted. So like if we zoom in, it's not as tight as it looks from far away. You see? So yeah, I just let this go a little bit longer. And one thing I can do here is I can just select certain areas. Um, if I pause this. Yeah, so let's say I want to work on the, the face in this area here. I can just marquee select this and then let it continue to go. And it'll just fill in this area not worry about the rest. I know the background I was going to repaint anyway. So, so this is what I'm looking for, right? I just want to get it to something like this, maybe make my brush a little bit smaller and let it go a little bit longer. Just I so I can see brushes over there, Mike. Um, and I know you're going to get to <laughs> talking about them, but yeah. there's, curiosity as to whether or not you create your own brushes or do you have brushes from others? Uh, in Painter, no. There's there's brushes that already exist. There's like, you guys have a, a, a trillion brushes in here, so um, I haven't really had a need to make one specifically. Um, oh, the other thing about this, uh, just quickly, just to, while it's doing it, if you don't stop the auto paint, it'll keep going and going and going. And then before you know it, it looks just like the, it looks just like this image, which is not definitely not what we want. Right. So you got to be careful and, and then just stop it. Um, so it doesn't keep going. But um, yeah, as far as the brushes, I, there's a few of them that I really like that I have tweaked and have in my, uh, in my palette here. Uh, the scratch board tool is pretty much the one that I go back to uh, again and again, and that gives me the uh, these fine little strokey details here. It also makes um, it gives you some nice nice little um, happy accidents to uh, to coin a phrase, coin a phrase, copy a phrase, steal a phrase from a well known person. You guys know who that is, right? All right. Um, yeah, but no, I, I, I don't uh, I don't really make my own brushes. I just kind of play with the ones you guys already have in there. So this is pretty much where I would stop it at this stage right here, right? So imagine this whole thing looks like this. And then at that point, I can make a new layer, look at my reference, which is important because I see what it's supposed to look like. And I can also look at uh, some comic reference of Spider Gwen. I think I realized after I did this that all of her, all these areas that I have that are red are supposed to be pink. So I went and uh, opened up a few pictures of her off of the web and, um, and started painting in some of these areas. All right, so let's see if I can...
this kind of a thing. One thing that I did realize after I made the sculpt is I didn't really like the way that I did the webbing on it. So I just went and recreated all of that with a color pencil and then went on top of it and did the highlights. Um, so once you get to this point, it's all about, you know, just making your own decisions and painting like you would normally. Some people are curious how long it took you to learn ZBrush. Uh, ZBrush took me, I mean, to to get to the point where I'm at now, I, I've been using it about uh, five years, but I was, it didn't take me very long to learn it at all. The great thing uh, that I had going in my favor is I have a lot of friends that I met through places like uh, uh, ZBrush Hangouts and, and Facebook and things like that who use it for, you know, if not for a living, then they, uh, they're some serious enthusiasts. So I was able to go in there and ask those guys questions about uh, the tools and they would just answer and help me out big time. So, but really I got a few books, um, went uh, to YouTube and looked at guys like uh, Ryan Kingsland and, and, uh, and, you know, things like that and just kind of learned it. So, I guess the answer to the question is maybe, I don't know, five months. I was, I was really going pretty strong. Now, um, I know that you, you showed that auto paint mm -hmm. and I think some people are, they're curious because there's the smart stroke painting, which automatically shrinks the size of the brush. And I mm -hmm. missed it because <laughs> I was answering questions, but I think that, you didn't use smart stroke and you just decrease brush size manually. I did. I turn that on and off sometimes. I, um, it depends. I have more luck doing it manually. Um, okay. yeah, so I, I, I did it, you know, just by stopping and changing the size of the, uh, changing the size of the stroke myself, the size of the brush rather. Do you but know? This is, oh, go ahead. What size you rendered out of Keyshot? Yeah, I can tell you. Um, let's see. Keyshot. Yeah, so the resolution's uh, 4470 by 3187 at 200 DPI. And it didn't have to be that big. I know a lot of the... Um, I just did uh, a project that I was working on in ZBrush Live uh, with the um, uh, with this with the princess in the background. I can't hide this stuff. Let's see, hide and hide and hide. Oh, come on. Okay, so this girl right here um, is uh, from an old uh, cartoon. And when I rendered her to paint over, the size wasn't that big. I think it might have been like, you know, 24 something um, wide and uh, 200 DPI. You don't have to have really a whole lot of resolution if you're going to do an auto paint because you're going to kind of wipe out all of that, um, all that detail anyway. Oh, with this one, by the way, this kind of tells you this piece I didn't use auto paint. This piece, I just took the, the 3D model and I just uh, turned down the opacity of it and painted right on top of it. So it depends on kind of what mood I'm in, whether I, whether I use auto paint. Um, but, uh, you know, got a lot of options. Do you use anything for color calibration? I do. I have the... Um, I'll tell you the name of it. I have the X-Rite uh, I1 display. And uh, the only reason I use that one, I used to have a Pantone um, calibrator. 
and I noticed that I was always off. So I switched to this one um, after doing a little bit of research and it seems to work pretty well. Can you let us know what some of your favorite brushes are? Definitely. Um, there's, it's funny, I've been using Painter for a long time now, and uh, the brushes that I really rely on heavily are the oil pastels, um, the scratchboard tool, and some of the, um, some of the, uh, the FX brushes. Um, those are the ones I come back to time and time, you know, time and time again. I do like the real stroke brushes, but the thing about it is, I, uh, the clients that I have are looking for a particular type of, uh, of image. So, you know, if I was doing this for myself, I'd be more experimental about it and get into some of the more realistic thick strokes and things like that, that, uh, that were included with, um, 2018. Um, but if I'm doing it for clients like those cards and, and, you know, movie posters and everything, they want a very specific they're coming to me for a very specific type of a look. Are you using a Cintiq right now? Yes, I am on a uh, 27 QHD. Okay. Yeah, I, I've been using a Cintiq for the past three years. Um, before that, I was always using an Intuos of some form, usually a six by nine or six by eight, whatever the format is, six by nine, I think. I found that as I was using that, I was working uh, at one point so much that I started to get problems with my wrist being in the same, you know, in the same type of uh, uh, pose all day long. So um, I talked my wife into letting me get one of these things and it's, I also have it on a, a stand that kind of moves around so it helps uh, alleviate those problems. And the name of the calibrator was X right. Yeah, it's uh, X right X dash R I T E, okay. and it's the I one display is the one I have. It's not the newest one that they have, but I think I got it a few years ago. Okay, and it works with the Cintiq, I assume. Yes. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, on the Wacom site, I think that's the one that they. They show with their uh, with their models. If you wanted to get one from them, they sell it there too. So anyway, you can see it's just kind of building up the uh, the layers and laying down the strokes, but. My biggest concern when I'm doing these paintings is not the rendering, that part. I've done it long enough that that's, that's not a problem, but having good reference is, is always an issue. Um, so like if I, uh, let's see, you know, if I come over here <clears throat> for some of this stuff that I've, uh, I've done in the past where I didn't have reference, like uh, say this piece. All I had was uh, a line drawing that uh, that I created based off of the uniforms. Um, this is something that I did before the movie came out, and um, and so there was uh, they sent over concept art uh, created by other other artists, and uh, and I had to make all this stuff based on that. So for this, there was a whole lot of looking at pictures of hot toys and um, old you know, Captain America movies and you know, all kinds of stuff to get this, to get this look. Um, I was online looking at archery things to try to figure out the way that the compound bow should look. And so that's one of those things where you, um, in fact, you can see like that's, that's kind of what I started off with and, uh, and then just started kind of going for it. Um, 
and the lighting on this, if you, you know, if you really want to break it down, the, it probably isn't right, but it didn't matter because, you know, at the end of the day, you just want a piece that looks interesting, you know? So, but the, for that piece, I really had a short de de deadline. Same, same thing for this Black Panther. Um, that was one where it was the first one that I used the process with. So I made, made him in ZBrush. Um, this was the piece that, that kind of led me to this pipeline, this workflow. Um, and, uh, and use that as my reference and then just kind of got my drawing and did this guy, you know? You see you sampling while you're painting this clone source. Mm -hmm. Is there a particular reason that you sample so much? Yeah, that's um, that's part of the reason why I clone it. So um, I have my colors from the from the source image right here in my painting, and I don't have to keep going over to the either the temporal color picker or over here to the to the color well and picking colors. They're already for the most part on my screen, and that saves a lot of time. Like if I'm painting the less movement that I have to do or keystrokes that I have to do, the, the quicker that I can get something done, you know? So that's mm -hmm. pretty much why I do that. There is a, a loaded question here from Deanna. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she wants to know how you make eyes look realistic, which is probably a, a longer answer than uh, it's, it's really not that, not that deep. Um, if you can paint a sphere, you can paint an eye. So the, let me see if I can find anything that I have an actual eye. <laughs> you know, I think I make them look realistic because everybody I paint has white eyes, probably. Let's see, do I have anybody with any eyes? Get this one. Yeah, so it's just, uh, it's let's just do it. Um, you know, the, uh, wasn't the cover of 2017? You could see her eyes in that, couldn't you? Oh yeah. Let me let me open that. Oh. While you're looking for that. Yeah. Is there a particular reason that you use Daz versus ZBrush? Oh, I don't use Daz anymore. I started in Daz because I didn't know how to use ZBrush. Actually, okay. I didn't know about ZBrush. Um, originally, when I was, I used to be an art director for a company, a uh, young men's brand called Echo. And um, back in the day, uh, I used to use Poser. Um, but I got tired of having to, you know, pay for updates and stuff. I found out that Daz was free. So I was like, oh, let me try that. And uh, I actually have a friend um, uh, named Sam that does a lot of uh, comic book stuff. And he used to, uh, he started off with Daz and then he kind of told me about uh, ZBrush and that's how I started using it. So yeah, this is the piece you're talking about. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just basically looking at your reference and painting what you see, and then also just being mindful of the highlights. Uh, you know, with with females, I tend to make their eyes a little more bright, um, but you don't want to get too crazy with the highlights, or else it starts looking like a you know an anime piece. Um, but yeah. Just uh, it's just painting a sphere basically, and then working uh, you know, working in your highlights and stuff. I'm sorry if that's not helpful. I'm waiting for any comments in here, and uh, nothing yet. So. Okay, so then for this shoe, I think what I ended up doing. Um, so this process isn't exactly the way I did it. I think what I originally did was I took the uh, 
I took the um, this piece and just did a quick uh, draw over on it. And then that's where I played with my proportions to make it feel more like uh, like this one in my pencils. So once that was done, then uh, I was able to overlay that on the clone and kind of paint the details. I knew exactly how the sole of the shoe looked because I had it in front of me. So there's a lot of back and forth with this process. Um, like I say, I don't always use uh, auto paint, only when it's like, a breakneck deadline that I have to that, that I have to turn it um, but I find that you know it does save me some time sometimes are you completely traditional these days or do you or sorry digital or do you do any traditional I haven't done traditional painting in a long time I it's funny I I purchased a number of canvases that I always plan to go back and paint. Um, I, my roots are pretty much as an airbrush artist and, uh, and I used to paint with acrylics on small uh, cold press boards with like really tiny brushes. Um, but I haven't done traditional paintings in a long time. What's interesting is that digital sculpting has been my gateway to traditional sculpting. So now I'm uh, I'm I'm all about you know kind of messing around with real clay and uh, and uh, and sculpting. I'm going to get back to painting. It's one of those things where I have so much on my plate that I I just haven't done it in a while. But anyway, as this goes along, what I would do is um, I think. The first thing I realized was I, I hated the background, so I just kind of went in and got rid of that. Painted that out and made it a sky. Once I grounded it with a background, it, it really helped. Turn up my opacity here. You never do, you don't do traditional overpaints of your work. It's just all digital. Yeah, no, it's it's all digital. Yeah. Tom is wondering why, why are you isolating the area you're working on with the um, selection? Marky. That was just for the clone, uh, and I just never turned it off. So uh, I didn't even realize I had it on until just a second ago. Oh, okay. Now the thing about, like I love these oil brushes, but in here, and I, I noticed that even when I'm painting in something like the Google Hangout, um, it it starts to move slow. So um, yeah, I see I got the spinning beach ball. My computer is very old, the one that I'm working on now. I'm going to, uh, probably gonna be updating it, if not the, you know, this year, next year, uh, early. Somebody did ask how much RAM you have. <laughs> uh, 32, I think. Okay. Yeah, 3264. Uh, let me see. Let's find out. Um, oh, yeah, 32. 32 gigs. Okay, thanks. Yep. Is there a particular media or brush that you use for blending? Yeah, Just Add Water too. I love it. Um, I used to use the original Just Add Water, and now I've switched to the um, to the two because there's a two after it, and it's better. <laughs> it's more advanced. Yes. Yeah. It is. yeah. <laughs> and do you always work in layers? Yeah, always, always, because I, I I'm very uh, I'm I'm all about the non-destructive workflow. So you can see even here I'm very messy with laying in this background, but it's not going to matter because I can come in and make a layer mask and paint away the areas that overlap uh, her, you know. Um, so by painting this way, I can just really slap down colors and um, and not really care about being precise or making masks. I used to 
take a whole lot of time to make masks and stuff. I, I don't really do that anymore. I just kind of do this and then use layer masks to, to clean up the areas. So like now I can just come in with a layer mask, turn that on. Oops. And then, uh, am I on the right one? Yeah. Turn that on. And then if there's something that I covered up that I don't, that I don't want covered, I can just erase it away. This question is a bit foreign to me. And Jeremy says it's a bit off topic, but he's curious what paints you use to paint your 3D printed sculptures, or do you leave them the color of the filament? I actually do not have a single one of my 3D printed sculptures yet. Um, I'm I'm supposed to be getting my first one soon, but uh, I'm I'm kind of torn. I don't I don't know yet. I, I'm worried about messing up the original, and I like the look of uh, I like the look of gray sculpts. Like that's you know if we. We come over here real quick. Like I love the look of just the unpainted sculpt. So I would like to have that as well as a painted one. So maybe I would get a uh, get a mold, um, like cast and mold it, and then paint the uh, you know the next one. But um, like I got this guy I'm working on. I just like the way that it looks unpainted. You know what I mean? That's just me. Why does he have a good lead on some? Some paints for me. I'm down. I just don't. I, I don't know how to use them. I don't. I don't know anything about them. Wait a second. Um, Claudia is wondering if there's any reason why you didn't dedicate a layer just for her when you cloned. You can do that. Oh, oh, oh. When I cloned it. Well, when I clone it, it's 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 initially going to be cloning on just the canvas, right? Yeah. Yeah. So. I would let that run until it's completely finished and then probably just isolate her from the background and then just, I don't have to worry about doing it the way I'm doing it now. I could just paint in the background flat and, uh, and then she's on her own layer. Um, because it's so kind of throwaway right now. Uh, and I, what I mean by that is that I didn't, I didn't let it finish cooking and it's not a whole lot of detail on that. I normally just paint over, you know, drop the layers down, uh, and then when I have something that I like, and then make a new layer and paint over top of that. Is it possible to bring in layers from ZBrush or to isolate the character? Yeah, you can do that. Well, you can, yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, I've got this guy here in ZBrush, if I wanted to, what I could do is I could, um, you can, render like a, a pass that masks it out or you know for somebody like me who doesn't doesn't really use compositing in zbrush you you also can do that in keyshot but if i wanted to you know isolate this what i would do is i would just take this background and make it some color that's you know like this and then do um uh, like a bpr render and i would just select the purple and it's automatically gonna you know, cut her away from everything else. But you can totally do that. Great, thank you. Yep. In fact, when I did my original, when I made my original render in Keyshot, I did what's called a clown pass. Let's see if I can open that. Um, and you can see renders, renderings. Spider Gwen. Um, okay, I don't see her on on it, but uh, like this is an example of what that looks like, and you can see it's it's great because you can just select this and and automatically cut out whatever you want. Keyshot also will do a specific color for every sub tool that you have um, so you can uh, or I'm sorry material that you have so you can really get in there and be specific if I wanted to pull the the helmet away from th this is a, a girl running and a dude by the way 
But um, if I wanted to pull and isolate her skirt or, you know, the boots or whatever, um, then it will make that a, a different, you know, flat color and it makes it very easy to select it. So in addition to what you're just showing us here mm -hmm. in Photoshop, mm -hmm. what else do you use Photoshop for in your workflow? Oh, that's a great question. So in, all right, a lot of times what I'll do is I bounce back and forth between Painter and Photoshop. Um, so I'll work on the painting, and uh, I think for this one, what I started doing was I got maybe 50% of the way through it before I realized that I didn't like the proportions of the original render. So if we come back to the original and we look at it, like something about it just bothered me. I, I didn't like, I just didn't like the layout of it. So I went into Photoshop. Um, let me open it over there. Um, you know what, let's just do it with this guy over here, right? So let's say it's, um, let's say it's the bishop. So like I could quickly just grab something on him, like say, you know, I want the, I want the arm to be in a different position. Um, you know, just come in here and mess with it, you know, or, uh, you know, I want him to have a giant Rick and Morty arm for some reason, right? I could do that in here or go into, I mean, I know you can do these transformations in, in Painter as well, but for me, it's just faster doing it here. And then I will go into, um, into the liquify, uh, and, you know, just play with, like, say I decided that the, um, say I decided that his arm wasn't big enough, you know, I just go in and make it, like, super huge, you know. And I do this for people's likenesses a lot. I'll find that when I'm painting a, uh, a portrait of somebody for, say, a movie poster, um, it'll be close, but it's not exactly the way that I want it to look, or the likeness is, is very close, but it's not there, or maybe sometimes it's way off. Um, and I can come in and take the painting that I've already created. I already like all the strokes and everything, uh, and go in and mess with the, you know, the placement of the, the eyes or the nose or whatever to make it a little more dialed in. And I say, okay. And then once that's looking very kind of Morty, I'll bounce back over to painter and, uh, and then just keep painting. You know what I mean? Tanya, you obviously don't watch Rick and Morty or you'd be dying right now. That's hilarious. <laughs> so how long, you know, on average, because I know you do a lot of these, how long would you spend painting in Painter? Sometimes you use the auto paint to speed it up, and then other times you don't. Yeah. What would be the difference in time saved? Um, I mean, I, I don't know that I can really quantify the, the amount of time that it saves me. Uh, I know that when I do a painting for a client, usually I'll have, you know, if I'm lucky, I'll have two weeks. More more often than not, I'll have maybe a week. Um, but then there's times when I only have a few days, and I and I paint based upon what I'm given. So for this piece you're looking at right here, uh, you know, you guys gave me enough time to really kind of cook the details, and I was able to, uh, you know, I was able to get a lot of little little tiny things that. I noodled around with until I got it to look to look really nice. If I if I didn't have that time, I would have still given you a finished painting, but it just wouldn't have been as crispy as this. Um, you know, so it really varies. But uh, you know, the 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 auto painting. The reason, like I said, the reason that I use that is uh, when I do use it is to give me the the colors that I need and. You know, it, a lot of the things that I get from Keyshot, I do like. I just don't want that piece to look digital. Um, when you do a paint over, sometimes 
you can let too much of that original image poke through and it, it's like why'd you even paint it you know because it looks like it looks like a render uh, and that's something that I definitely don't want I don't want somebody to be able to look at one of my paintings and say oh man that that looks like it's a uh, paint over you know like that's the last thing I want or that looks like it's a it's just a 3d thing that he colorized or something like that yeah you put a lot of detail into your work <laughs> yeah is, I, there, I, I, is there a particular brush you use for hair yeah I use I, I mean I'll be honest with you that scratch board tool that I have is my Swiss Army knife I use that for everything so these um, in this one I started using some color pencil you can see down here there's strokes in here that look like color pencil uh, I used them on these little light trails as well but for the most part 90% of this is that scratch board tool and that goes for the hair as well because I can get some nice you know wide brush areas that give me some you know some of those happy accidents as far as the way it lays down if I go back over to painter am I in painter oh I'm in painter all right um so I'll just make a new layer here so the thing about this brush is when I lay it down turn down the pressure when I lay it down it does when you overlay it uh, with a with a stroke it does kind of weird interesting things um, so I like that and I'll use if you look at my pieces up close they're they're not really as clean as they look far away like if you zoom in you'll see that on her forehead you have a lot of that that look um, same thing with the hair it's not clean uh, up here I use color pencil actually on top of this but uh, you know the the trick about it is when you back out and it looks like something that's really really tight but when you zoom in it looks it looks messy I think that's that's if I had a signature look that's my look <laughs> you know mm -hmm. but this this scratch board tool just by pressure I can get like a really nice thin line and that'll let me do these these flyaway hairs really nicely Have you ever used Photoshop 3D? No. No. I don't really, um, I'm not super into the 3D side of it. So a lot of times, uh, you know, say I was working for a gaming company or, or somebody that does a lot of 3D, uses a lot of 3D act, act, um, assets, they're very used to making UVs and and you know exporting their OBJs and and all that good stuff and texturing. Um, I poly paint for the most part. I don't I don't really leave ZBrush if I don't have to. And uh, I think that kind of for me it speeds up the workflow. I don't have to worry about topology as much, even though I like to keep the topology kind of clean. Um, I don't have to worry about it being pristine, and I don't have to worry about edge flow. Um, unless it concerns the sculpt. Uh, and by doing that, then I can just bounce directly from ZBrush into uh, either, you know, Keyshot or, or directly into a painting program and, and kind of go to work. All right, well, we're getting close to the top of the hour. And to be honest, most of the questions that remain are related to 3D. So oh. I'll, I'll try and summarize, I think, the main question from people is, with this guy right here, for instance, the veins on his arm, uh -huh. is that something that was generated by ZBrush, or did you? No, this entire thing is a sculpt. Okay, so you sculpted yeah. all that in. Yes. The other question is, you know, are there models that you can buy? Like, for instance, if someone is painting a lot of animals, mm -hmm. purchase models? To start absolutely. With. Yeah, absolutely. Like you can go to uh, something like a Turbo Squid or, or you know, look online and find a place that sells assets. I was looking at something. It was crazy though. Like I mean, it depends on what you are willing to to pay to get a good, you know, just like a good piece of reference. When I made this guy, I had to put him inside of a subway. So I hopped on to uh, I hopped on to I think it was Turbo Squid, and I bought a section of a subway car 
and I, you know, was able to light him inside of that. But I mean, some people they sell their stuff for. I saw animals over the Christmas break; they were selling for like twenty five hundred dollars. I'm like, are you crazy? Um, but you can get them for much cheaper than that. I mean, you can get a tiger for five bucks if you want, if you find it in the right place, you know. So the the the, the short answer to that is uh, is yes, you can just buy those base tools, those base uh, base meshes, use those. Okay, great. And the final thing that I just want to mention is that um, Painter works on both Mac and Windows. The application is exactly the same because someone asked if you can do this using Windows instead of Mac. And yes, you can. Yeah, you can. Oh, just so people know, I have a, uh, I have a PC as well. And in fact, I'm going to probably my next machine is I'm going to, I'm going to build a PC. But uh, the same applications that I have on my Mac, I have on the PC, and it's newer and faster. So I use that. Um, I use that when I can. It's also mobile. Um, but yeah, Painter, ZBrush, all that stuff comes on everything. Mm -hmm.